Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Concordia, Concordia University's fourth space. And thank you for joining us uh, for Click, Zooming Through the Lens of Experience. And uh, we'll be starting with the digital photo exhibit. Um, we're streaming live to YouTube um, from Fourth Space, and Fourth Space is located on unceded Indigenous lands in Chajage, or Montreal. And here at Fourth Space, we collaborate with our university community uh, by activating research projects and initiatives uh, across the university uh, through daily activities. And we are running this, uh, this event as a live streamed meeting. Uh, and so we welcome your comments, your questions uh, with a raised hand or via the chat uh, if you are uh, joining by Zoom. Uh, for those of you who are in the space, uh, if you'd like to participate, uh, just let us know, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you so that everyone on Zoom can hear uh, your questions. But it's now my pleasure to hand it over to Nash. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this uh, very snowy day. Those of you who are joining us um, online, welcome. Um, hope we get a chance to have a face-to-face -face Zoom meeting with you soon. Um, and those of you who are going to be watching us asynchronously later, um, welcome to you as well. Um, I'm pleased to be um, presenting a host of wonderful um, artists who have become friends in the course of this project. And today we are going to be sort of uh, showcasing their work as they come and talk to you about uh, why they take pictures and how they take pictures. Um, so just the order of the day, um, we are going to have a little digital photo exhibit that everybody would be talking about uh, their ways of photography. Uh, we're going to then have a conversation cafe for those of you who are online, you probably, you're missing on the fun that we're going to get together and then have fun and, and talk to um, each other. Uh, then we are going to present and uh, sort of um, unveil the book that we have created uh, together. And finally, we are going to have a conversations with the researchers who have been involved in designing um, this project. Uh, so soon I'm going to be introducing uh, the, the project uh, principal investigator, Dr. Shannon uh, Hablethwaite, and um, we will be joined by other uh, researchers, uh, Kim Sochak and uh, Constance Lafontaine, uh, Karen Lee and Natalie Phillips, hopefully if she can join us, and also um, Aaron Johnson. So we will be talking about different aspects of connection, communication, community and creativity in the round table and sort of hash out some of the ideas of how we can sort of uh, mediate um, um, our thoughts, our emotions, our connections through these uh, new ways of uh, communication and knowledge creation. Um, so welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Shannon Hablethwaite. She is the she is the principal investigator of this uh, project, the professor in the Department of Applied Human uh, Resources, and she is the one who has been providing us the resources and uh, sort of the the support for getting this project into the stage that it is. And I will be talking about the tangent that we have sort of taken with this project later um, during the day. Welcome. Thanks. Nash. Uh, thanks, Nash, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, bienvenue, welcome. It's my pleasure to be here for Click, Zooming Through the Lens of Experience, our um, exhibition here for the day. As Naj mentioned, my name is Shannon Heblethwaite, and I am a professor in the Department of Applied Human Sciences. Um, we get confused with human resources all the time, so that's not Applied Human Sciences. And um, I have for just finished a four-year term as the inaugural director of Engage, which is Concordia's Center for Research on Aging. So that's where this kind of all came together. All of us are affiliated and involved with the center. Um, we are really excited to be back here in person and with those of you joining us online to this event that culminates a three, maybe four year now, maybe more uh, long project, uh, a few pandemic delays through the way, as many of you can probably appreciate, of the project that we had um, 
funded that was called Enhancing Agency, Understanding the Potential for Older Adults Use of Digital Health Technology. And so I would like to extend our appreciation to TELUS Health for their support of the project, which really um, was focused and we were interested in understanding more about people's experiences online of what we um, kind of grouped together and called digital media. In this case, participating in an online photography course. And what we were curious about is how this might be influenced or enhanced by adding an opportunity for social engagement through that. So, um, so, so hold on. This is this is not digital, this is my old hard copy paper, uh, still preferred way of doing things. Um, I want to first then, of course, thank all of the folks who participated in this study for your time, for your engagement, your creativity, and your insights into this experience. Without all of you, this wouldn't have been possible. So a huge thank you to all of you. Um, I want to thank, of course, the folks from the fourth space uh, for their generosity and, and support in hosting us here today. It's wonderful to be in an accessible, inclusive public environment where we can engage together in this process of, of research and art, research creation, some of us might say. I want to also acknowledge and extend my thanks to the researchers, uh, Naj has mentioned them, but um, for the record, I will again, from Concordia, who have worked on this project with me for many, many years, from the initial thoughts and proposal and negotiating the process along the way and figuring out what we were going to do and changing it nine times through the pandemic <laughs> based on public health restrictions and things like that. So that, um, of course includes Karen Lee, Natalie Phillips, and Aaron Johnson, who are in the Department of Psychology, Kim Sachuk in the Department of Communication Studies, and Naj Mahani, who originally in the process joined us in her capacity as a researcher at the Perform Center, and then has transitioned into a more extensive role with us over, the over time. So we will hear from them later in the day about some of their work more generally. We are, um, as you can sort of judge a little bit by the departments we come from, we are an interdisciplinary team. And um, this interdisciplinary research certainly is a trend, it's a laudable goal, but it does require a lot of openness to collaboration, um, to different methods, different ways of thinking about research and of knowledge more generally. So I thank all of them for agreeing to play on this team together for all their flexibility and expertise and perseverance over, over all of the adjustments and changes and learnings that we had through the process. Last and certainly not least, I want to thank our amazing team who worked so hard over the last year and a bit to bring this project to fruition. So Naj Mahani, amazing. Uh, she transitioned to the team and became the coordinator of the project. She uh, had so much passion about it and she made it happen. And, and so a huge thank to Naj for all of her work in, in coordinating and thinking and, and helping us think more broadly and engage together. So I'm really excited for that. Berkeley Peterson, who is a PhD student in the Department of Psychology. I think when the project started, Berkeley was a master's student in the Department of Psychology. So she's um, been with us as a graduate research assistant from the beginning. Uh, and especially kept us all together. <laughs> um, I couldn't have managed all of that in terms of the, the numerous quantitative surveys and scales and, and doing those with you at the beginning of the project and at the end. So um, huge shout out to Berkeley for all her work along the way, among many other things <laughs> that she's been involved with. We certainly also benefited, um, Berkeley in particular, from and Naj, uh, from the assistance of Adrian Calcagnato, 
and Juliana Jacob from the Department of Psychology, who helped Najm and Berkeley with the questionnaires and, and getting those initial Zoom connections happening. So we certainly thank them for their efforts. And we can't forget Momo, uh, who's hiding over there in the back in the corner. Uh, she's our most recent addition to the team uh, and was a huge help in, in each of the weekly Zoom sessions, troubleshooting, supporting, participating with all of you. And a huge, huge thanks to Naj and Momo for, for bringing today's event to fruition. This was above and beyond what we initially envisioned uh, in terms of the project. And thank you to a generative, collaborative, supportive, enthusiastic group of, of folks who participated in that. Um, to share all of the photographs and art that you will see here today. So it is amazing. I just had a quick peek through the book and I'm so excited to hear more from all of you about your experiences of doing that and, and the photographs and what that meant. So welcome for the day. I know that some, of, some may be in and out over the course of the day. So uh, welcome and I look forward to a really uh, interesting, interesting conversations with all of all of us throughout the day thanks uh, I think now I'll turn it back over to Naj who's going to coordinate our, our photography um, exhibition yes thank you um, hi again um, it's it's a very snowy day so we had queued up the presentations by the way they're present they're sort of appearing in the book and in the book there is an order into the story as um, it's being told, but the weather seemed to not cooperate with us. So we're going to sort of start, uh, the order is going to be a little bit different. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is that I would be inviting uh, the artists who have contributed to this exhibition to sort of come here. And um, as we go through their photos, maybe they can tell us a little bit about why they have taken those photos and uh, um, and why they take photos. Um, so I don't want to take too much space and I would like them to explain their own artistic process uh, themselves. Um, when we organize this, uh, we ha I have not sort of given a specific time to anyone just guessing that things such as pandemic and the weather might uh, sort of uh, change our order a little bit. So in the interest of everybody's comfort, I'm going to ask for a volunteer to come and speak about the work first um, on the list because uh, because uh, jack and marilyn haven't arrived yet it would be jackie but i'm not sure if jackie is comfortable to come and tell us about her work perfect thank you thank you jackie please uh, so jackie uh yes please come jackie ray Wolowski. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, apologize for mispronouncing everybody's uh, names. Jackie, I think this would be the best spotlight for you. Okay. So this is the mic and you should hold it close to yourself, unlike me who just keeps moving it away from myself so that everybody would be hearing you. Um, I'm, going to do, I'm going to let you do the introduction yourself. Um, all I can say is that Jackie is a professional artist and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your artistic process, how you take photos, um, how you have been using digital photography despite making those elaborate paintings that you do. So thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, is this the right spot, like here? OK, so this, for example, is taken on the canal on the, near the bicycle path. And when I saw the area, suddenly inspiration struck and I had to take photographs. So I took many, but this is the one I decided to use for my painting. So that's, this is also another one like that. It's on the Cary Expressway. And this building is no longer there, I think. But anyway, you see the car zooming by and because I'm taking it at, in the evening, it's, it's slower. So the cars just go flash and everything else is there. And because my camera at the time decided to make it more red. That's the photograph. I decided I like it too, and I did it the same way. There's a, another one too. The Cary Expressway, another favorite area of mine, because I live right near there. 
and I love the way the, the cars look like little pomegranate seeds or something. But I've done several paintings like that. And uh, I only have, I don't have any left. Actually, they're gone, which is fine. <laughs> I should do some more, but I keep moving on to the next thing. This is a duck, of course. And I, what I really like about it is the way the water reflects. I accentuated it slightly, but not too much with Photoshop. I didn't do a painting or drawing of this, but you know, time permitting and all, who knows? <laughs> um, these aren't quite as vibrant as they look here. I, you know, accentuated it, but I love the, the flower and the color. And so I thought they were very unusual flowers. And this one, I love the swoop of the grass. One flower stuck in there nicely and uh, naturally. And that would make a nice painting too. So another possible. Staircases. I have a whole series of staircase, stair, staircases from the Montreal Museum of Fine Art. In fact, I brought two with me so anyone could see them later. And when I first saw the staircase, I was really struck by it and I said, I have to take pictures. So I did, I, I went back a few times, took more. <laughs> That's the photograph. So this is my daughter when she was little at the lake. And of course she doesn't have wings, but the butterfly did. And those little fairies in the background, they're taken from, I forget the name of the illustrator, but I thought they were great fairies. Uh, um, and I put them in the background. So this, this has about four different inking plates, uh, each one done separately and put together. There's Alexi herself. This is another staircase at the um, AGO, Montreal, no, Toronto Museum. And I really like the shapes in it, so I did some paintings of that also. Oh, that got skipped. There's the painting. So this is a toad that I met, and I thought, you're a great toad. And I like the, the background, so I did a painting, and then I did a drawing of it. He sort of blends in well. There's a painting. So this is when you could still go on the end car of the Toronto subway and stand there and take pictures out the back. You can't do that now because they've changed the cars. But uh, I really like the, the way everything works in this photograph. And this is taken on the bus along the highway. And I focused and kept my camera on the trees and everything else is in motion. So this is right here at Atwater. That was one or two years ago, a surprise snow, snowfall in April. There you go, that's me. The next person. Uh, is this okay? Yeah, it's working. Thank, thank, thank you, Jackie. So maybe, maybe you can tell me a little bit. No, you can hold this. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you take digital photos. What kind of a camera you used to take those digital photos? Um, uh, I always used to have a Nikromat with film, but as soon as I was able to, and they came in, I started. I got the digital because the nice thing about digital is it doesn't matter how many you take. You know, you're restricted with the the film camera. I'll have a roll of 24. I better make sure everything is exactly what I want. And you don't know until you develop it. But digital, of course, um, gives you uh, unlimited possibilities. And so I've upgraded my digitals as I went. So something else that I wanted to ask you is when you're taking photos, you also create very um, a sort of um, similar paintings of those. So what is the thought process behind that? Oh, because um, so this is a great photograph, but it's a photograph, but I can do more with it if I make a painting out of it. And that's basically why. So you're, you're creating something new from, yeah. from the photograph. Yeah, and I do that with faces too. I've done quite a few portraits. So you work as a professional artist. Yeah, I must uh, say I'm rather lazy the last few years, but in general I do, yes. 
<laughs> is there anything else you like to talk about um, to the world? Just the fact that, you know, there's possibilities out there. And if you take a picture of it, you'll be able to keep them. Like I have lots of pictures of houses or buildings either being taken down or going up. And once it's up, you'll never know what it was like before. And once it's gone, it's gone. So I, I might have had a picture of it in its full form, but how, when they're taking it down, it's something else entirely. And I find like junkyards are very interesting too, you know? Does anybody have questions for Jackie? <laughs> Pass the mic if anybody. The pictures, are you taking them with your cell phone or a real no, camera? No, camera. A real camera. Yeah, okay. I usually use my tiny one, but uh, a while ago I spurred on a bigger digital, which is a little bit sharper and nicer, you know, and more possibilities, but either one is good. Anyone else? All right. Thank yeah. you so much, Jackie. Oh, Momo has a question. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I was admiring your photos and then the paintings that you do uh, of them. Your photos have a lot of detail and you really convey that to your painting. So I was wondering, uh, well, how much hours does a painting take <laughs> you? And I guess you might be like very patient because that's a lot of detail for for a painting for example the toe i mean all of your all of your uh, paintings the the building with the lights that you actually sometimes it was difficult when we were putting your paintings together and your pictures it was difficult sometimes to tell which, is which, which? one is the painting and <laughs> which one is the picture so if you can uh, tell me a little bit about like how many hours you I you really don't know the hours. Sometimes I spend all day doing it, sometimes just a, a few hours per day, and it could be um, many days in a row because, you know, you get enthusiastic, or it could be a gap between. So I don't know the total, but it's not a huge amount. I just happen to work, I guess, a little quickly. Um, when I was working commercially, I worked for a store called Import Bazaar, which then became Pier One, but when it was Import Bazaar, I did pen and ink drawings of the items to put in the ads. And uh, <laughs> that was all done from having it in front of me. So I got a lot of practice in that and I do, did a lot of detail in that, like doing a bedspread or you know the weaving on a basket, all that. So I, I got pretty good at that. Thank you, Jackie. It's, uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to have the whole day so you can talk to Jackie more about uh, her artistic process. Thank you. A round of applause for Jackie, please. <laughs> uh, next on our list, and thank you for being here, Peter, is Peter Scahan, um, another practicing artist who, um, from what you have been telling me, you discovered the possibilities of cellular phone uh, photography. So I let you tell about the stories that you tell with your oh, camera right. and with your paintings as well. So nice to have a microphone here. It's... Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So can... <laughs> is this close? Okay, that's better. Uh, can you repeat what you just asked me? <laughs> Honestly, I'm asking you to talk about yourself oh, okay. and about the photos as they're showing and then how, why you take photos and just, just tell us about okay. yourself. So I worked uh, <clears throat> in my working career, I was a graphic artist and uh, towards the latter part of my career, the cell phone came in and uh, it became a tool that I used to, uh, I say this in my, in the book, um, as a visual note taking, a means of visual note taking, but I never really looked at it as a, as a, as a, you know, a viable camera, as a real camera. Um, so I, I would take pictures of family and things like that, but it was, it was never, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't until I took this, was part of this uh, research project that I thought, well, <laughs> I don't have a real camera, so I'd be happy to participate, but this is what I have. And so I thought, OK, I'll give me uh, the opportunity to explore what my camera can do finally, instead of just, you know, the uh, point and shoot kind of thing. Part of um, 
I guess my art is uh, trying to keep things light or show the beauty or fun in, in daily life. I also really, I like faces more and more. I'm discovering that. Um, uh, okay, so this this was this, the photograph that goes with this. So I don't, I don't. Forward is going to sort of bring you to to the slide. We have um, we have queued. I, I think the pictures are in a folder, and then as you're clicking about them, maybe you can talk about it. But yes, there is a photo <laughs> that is accompanying this. Okay, there's a, um, okay. So, so that was uh, my my partner, and uh, she generously agreed to pose for this. But uh, that allowed me to capture, I guess, shadows. That's something else that I find really interesting. But it, it doesn't. Uh, it was. It's more about as a as a starting point the cellular photos that's what they were that's what they are for for my art they're there and and i try to take it a bit further uh the the actual when you when i start when i started the 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 research project i thought well i have to have to make more of an effort i have to compose i have to look for things that are that are interesting and it was it was quite a challenge too uh using a cell phone and as uh anyways uh yeah let's like <laughs> getting caught up in my uh my tongue is getting caught up here in my brain i think uh okay um i i like to to see things again all right i try i like it when somebody uh forces me to look at things differently or i look at them again because there's so many things that on a daily basis that we walk by and we ignore because we've seen them. So I was just out walking. It was the first snow day, uh, and I think it was in November, and I saw these guys and I thought, this is so funny. And somebody else uh, saw them as a potential, like a, like a canvas, and they had the snow that was, it was a beautiful day. And I thought this is this is wonderful, you know, and it's and it's it's not it's not a it doesn't pretend to be or it's not trying to be a great piece of art, but it's it captures something of the beauty and the vibrancy of the city we live in. Oh, there's my model there, looking very pensive. Um, so you see, I, I what I liked about that was the the chair and the cast shadow. So those were two things, and then I played from there. I I went on to do the do the uh, the, the uh, drawing. So look at this. I mean, this is just a picture of a pair, but it was again it was the cast shadow that I found interesting. The way it uh, it sort of it creates a another uh, I don't know another entity. You know, it's not just the pair or the vase. It's the this thing that connects the two of them. Oh, that was the same uh, winter day. That's beautiful. The the different shades of of gray that you get, or values that you get uh, w within that. I thought this is so nice, and yet people walk by things like this. Uh, you we walk by it all the time because we don't have time to look at them to really pay attention to them. And I thought, well, I have time. Well, oh, there's something. There's a. Uh, let's, uh, and in my neighborhood, I walk by this maybe five times a week, this area. In the wintertime, it looks different than this, obviously. But And one day, there's a fire hydrant right at the base of this, what looks like a stop sign in the foreground. And I, I went and stood over there, and I thought, isn't that funny? It's a, this discrepancy in sizes makes the stop sign look so small. But I thought, I mean, it's nothing... It's nothing uh, f fabulous, but it's uh, it was it's uh, it's fun. I, there's uh, the some in a playground, you know. The again, it was you have the the beautiful contrast of the dark and the light. That was what got my attention in that, you know. And again, the cast shadows, which become like another presence in the in the photo. This was in PEI and. Um, I think it was Momo that was telling us at one point you should you can you flip your camera around that gets you closer to the to the ground and and take the picture and so I I was uh, we were right on the beach and and I just was I was taken by the 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 pattern of the of the sand you know as the tide went out 
So it's, uh, well, this guy here, uh, <laughs> he was in a, it's a bowling pin that's been painted or it's been given a new life, I guess. That's how it looked to me. But, and uh, I, I just, I was, I love it. I thought it just made me laugh when I saw it. It was, just, it's so wonderful. I also, one thing I didn't see in it with, that with Nash pointed at it was my reflection in the background. So I guess I see him in myself or something. I don't know. It's, uh, so that's it for me. That's basically it. Uh, oh. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for going uh, about hope, this. Yes, but I didn't go too fast here. Well, so. no, I, I'll ask <laughs> questions and then others might have questions to ask. Um, one of the things that I noticed in, in, in the piece that you've written for the book is how the composition of objects is creating its own narrative. So I was wondering if we can sort of talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, that'd be more something that I can set up at home because I do like the the uh, the still life form of art. That's something I really enjoy doing because I can I can take all kinds of uh, disparate objects that aren't connected and put them together to form a, 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 a narrative. And uh, what's a lot of fun about that is you'll show it to somebody. And they'll have a completely different, like something that's not even connected to what I might have been thinking when I put these objects together. And it's so much fun to hear what other, how other people see it. But uh, yeah, you can, can make a story and, uh, and that sort of propels you or drives you through the, the, the time that might take to do the, the piece of work too, the story that's going on in your, does that answer? <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's a question. Uh, sorry, I'm going to ask another question and then I'm going to have you ask the questions. Um, something that you, you have frequently talked about in the meetings that we have, you're an alumnus of this uh, university, you graduated yeah. in 1981, and you've been talking about, you know, the difference between doing the drawings with pencil versus doing them in Photoshop or AutoCAD or whatever designers are using now. Would you like to elaborate on that experience? Yeah, well, I guess I wouldn't be a good uh, spokesperson for Adobe or anything like that. I, I, when I came to, when it came time for me to retire, I was so happy to get away from technology. You know, I just, I felt that you can do so many things with a computer and a tablet and a, a stylus and, and a mouse. But I felt it. It never. I never felt that it was really me, or I was. I, it or pushed me away from any kind of creative process. That's that's how it felt to me. So I was so happy when I retired to be able to just pick up a pencil and do things with a pencil and a piece of paper because it felt it felt more honest to me. It felt more creative, or you know the the connection between the hand and the, and the brain. You know it was shorter. Whereas with technology, it just seems to, you're out this, this, this rabbit hole that seems to be out there all the time. Um, I have been in conversation with Peter for the past six months, and I think we are going to be in conversation, but I'm going to stop my questions and anybody has questions for Peter. Uh, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, just uh, clarify, all these uh, photos were taken with a cell phone? Yeah, yeah, okay. the uh, the iPhone uh, um, 13 mini. It's the mini version. Right. It's and and there was no digital enhancement after no, you took the photos. No, it's just I, the way there, that they were taken. I, I tried as the as I did the followed the course. Uh, one of the lectures was talking about trying to just frame the the image without editing so i thought that that's quite the challenge but i did most a lot of the photos have been edited to be to bring out uh the composition more or what i want to focus on but i no, i wouldn't i i don't that doesn't work for me either the digital enhancement because it's that's closer to like what you saw that's uh, that's what i am that's sure. closer to sure. me it felt more honest great <laughs> Uh, Peter, you said that you do, uh, you set up your still life. Do you take photos of your still life as you set them up? Uh, yeah, and what I do more and more is to take, I'll take one or two photos. Uh, and then I will uh, 
change them into black and white to see for values, to see how it works for values, because it's really nice in a photograph or in a piece of art where you have a, a variety of, of values like blacks and whites and grays, as opposed to just all grays. So that's why I would use it to, yeah. And uh, well, I'll, uh, but I don't usually uh, draw from a photograph. It's strictly a reference, you know? Okay. Hi. Um, I think it's really interesting oh. in both of the presentations. What I um, struck me was that uh, these are very ordinary things, but the way of looking brings out another element. Um, yeah. And in yours, it was the shadows, the 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 sense of the shadow. And in Jackie's, it was the light. Uh, it's just very interesting to me that um, this sort of uh, other layer of reality that the artist uh, brings to the fore for, for us. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and I don't think, I think if we would all, you know, sometimes if we would slow down, we would all see these things uh, because they're there and they're, they're, they're fun to look at and they make life uh, from day to day, they make it more interesting, I find, you know, uh, but yeah, you're right. Well, artist or not artist, because everybody literally, not everybody, obviously, but many, many people, most people have cell phones today and they're, they're, they have the you know the potential to take wonderful pieces of uh, of art you know and not just point and shoot just to take the time and and, and explore yeah this is fun to have a microphone I, I, any <laughs> other questions <laughs> all right okay so if Enough. not we'll we'll talk to peter later over lunch thank you thank so you. much peter thank you So next on the list, actually, before Peter was Marilyn. I'm not sure, Marilyn, you just walked in. So are you ready to come and talk about uh, your work to us? If not, you can you can wait and come later. Oh, nothing. You just uh, hi, Marilyn. So hi. just stand here, and we are going to be showing your photos, and then. In general, I think what uh, the the sort of the procedure that evolved itself, uh, we didn't program it, is that they're going to show photos. You're going to talk about the photos that you take and then why you take them. Uh, so, Marilyn. Uh, well, don't hesitate to ask me a question. Just your last name. How do I pronounce Jurassic. it? Jurassic. <laughs> we have been discussing how to pronounce your last name properly today, uh, the same with, uh, with Jacqueline's. Um, Marilyn is actually a professional uh, photographer, but I think I should let Marilyn talk about um, her own uh, photographing practice and history and um, the reason why he's, she's taking the photos that you take. So the photos, they seem to have been in your folder and they're presenting them in no particular order. So if you like, just talk about how you take photos and then as we go through them, maybe you can sort of tell a bit of a story about why you have taken each of them. Well, it's very nice to be reminded of this picture. I took it at an open air market in the town of Mornington in Victoria, Australia. And I took it with my friend Kathy in mind because she's a knitter. And this woman to whom these hands belong was selling a wool that she had harvested, if you like, carded and spun. And I think she's a weaver. Anyway, I, she's not a young person and I loved her hands with the wool. Oh, this is on my back deck on a chair made of metal painted black and it is a recipe for a banana pancake which has no flour in it the recipe comes from my daughter uh, the um, red currants are from my garden 
And the dish is one of my favorite um, Royal Copenhagen issues. This is a little girl called Lola, a greyhound. Don't know if she's a rescue, but she lives with her two owners, two women, and another dog called Kiko, an Alsatian, and a cat, also female. They live in, they used to live in Sandringham in Melbourne, Australia. And I was their babysitter while the adults, thank you, uh, went on vacation to Asia. This appears to be a peony. I don't remember taking it. We guarantee that this photo was given to us by you. So I'm sure you have yes. taken it. No, I, I, I know I took it, yeah. So, but maybe maybe you can tell us a little bit about these uh, close-up, uh, these these well, ma micro shots that you take. Yes, I I um, I'm attracted by beauty and endlessly photographing what appears to me to be beautiful. You can see the way the light hits this subject; it creates more texture than you would otherwise if the sun was or the light was in a different at a different angle. So um, I haven't identified the bug, but I find the color very vivacious. The bug also has colors. They're living together and it appears, appeals to me. Oh, more red currants from the garden. The tiles belong to the floor and the wood belongs to one of my chopping boards. This is magnolia. Um, extraordinary the way they shed their seeds and open up. This is um, a child sleeping in a heat wave in a store called Udder and Ho in Loch Bina or Loch in southeast Gippsland, Victoria, Australia. I asked permission to photograph the child and that was given. You can see from the hair that this perspiration is gluing the hair down to the skin. Australia has many heat waves. Oh, this is Kiko, friend of Lola. This is Piper on a very long beach. I think it's called the 90 mile beach in Victoria, Australia. Um, this is the dog of her grandmother. He's very old. She knows exactly what to do with him. And um, it was a lovely day at the beach we had with that family, a picnic. I remember my cousin made banana bread. <laughs> Too much detail? <laughs> This is in Mornington. I think it was a lock-up house for criminals in historical Australia, but I'm not sure. I think it's now a protected building as per that blue disc on the wall, the front wall. Um, I like the geometry and the severity of it. This is a lane in Melbourne where graffiti artists ply their wares. Lots of tourists are attracted to this area. It's fun to photograph the tourists looking at the graffiti. Uh, this is Luna. She was a lively girl, not yet two years, black Labrador, full of beans. You could chase her around the house trying to get your socks that you left out to dry on a drying rack, and she would think it was a hoot to dash away from you and chew on them. So. Did these dogs pose for you? Because all of them seem to have a relationship to the camera. <laughs> um, did they pose? No, I don't think they did. They were just in their resting spots. Uh, this is my home, some Japanese lilac from the front garden, which cat, cat captures the light. This is actually, oh, it's all right. 
uh, so the light is coming from the roof upstairs. And otherwise, I guess it's underexposed. This is part of a painting at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. And I, if I'd known it was going to arrive here, I would have credited it better than I did. I think this is the photos that we have of you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Marilyn, you started uh, photography at the age of uh, 15, or at least that's when you were introduced to your first camera. That's true. And you have studied photography professionally, and you have also taken, uh, if I can say, um, micro photos in a biological lab. So would you tell us a little bit about this process of taking pictures in different scales and in different um, applications. Um, All right. Um, so yes, I won a camera in a beauty contest when I was 15 at a seaside resort in Victoria, Australia, where I'm from, in case you didn't, <laughs> I didn't make that clear. Um, but I've been here since 1970. So there were trips back home. Um, I won a camera and I started photographing people at home and at school and family. Um, when I was 17, I left home and went to Melbourne and I trained as a cytotechnologist. And that's where the microscopy comes in. We were actually uh, looking for cell changes, which would indicate the presence of cancer, especially gynecological cancer. Um, I came to Montreal at the age of 22. I was 42 when I went to professional photography school at the Dawson Institute of Photography um, and pregnant with my second child. Um, so um, it was very, refreshing to take the course where I met you, Naj, and where the other participants were also um, learning new things. Um, because on the one hand, it was familiar. On the other hand, it was all digital. When I went to photography school, it was film. So um, that was refreshing. I very much enjoyed taking the course. I found I had lots to learn and I didn't do much um, macro photography under the microscope, but I did some for my personal interest. Um, does anyone have questions for Marilyn? Marilyn, thank you very much. Uh, so zooming through the lens of experience, and since you started photography at a very young age, how do you compare that experience when there was no digital photography, everything was analog, everything was uh, film and uh, camera, and you had to wait probably a, couple, a few weeks before you see the result of your work uh, with now that you could probably basically go through everything that, that you've taken immediately and do the corrections and uh, shoot over and over if you wish to, as long as your uh, your the, the card in your camera actually allows you. Um, how do you how do you compare that experience? Uh, is this any better right now, uh, or that experience was something else? Or I'm, I'm I am getting very much nostalgic about all that. <laughs> well, many weeks later yes you would see the results thank you for your question and many dollars later because there was no opportunity to go back and correct what you can already see is an error so there was lots more waste i think and i think um, standards were lower because you would want that picture to pass it was the best of the bunch rather than the best you could take if you had seen the results faster. Of course, in professional photography, we can take Polaroids of a setup in a studio, let's say, and get immediate feedback. But no, it's so much better now, I think. Thank you. But uh, just add, 
I don't have a card in my camera. I don't have a camera. I'm using my phone. So the possibilities are as infinite as your uh, network uh, bandwidth allows? Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? Nice to see you all here. Thanks, Marilyn. We're Thank going to have more conversations over lunch. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think Jacqueline, you're next. <laughs> Jacqueline Vaughn. I now learned how to pronounce your name properly. <laughs> thank you very much. Not to... So we're going to go through the same routine. Your yes. photos are showing, but maybe before we start showing your photos, you can, you know, you can tell us about why uh, you're making. I have to say that uh, Jacqueline is the one who sort of uh, gave us the name for this exhibition. We had in the in the first meeting that we had together, we were brainstorming over what we should call this project and then she said well call it click because that's what the camera does and that's what we did together so and uh, yes go ahead well, so tell us about yourself and then we you go through much. your photos <laughs> um thank you it's wonderful to be here and uh um i'm delighted to show this first one this is probably one of the most abstract paintings i've ever done and it wasn't based on a photograph it was just putting paint on the paper and using a piece of cardboard and pushing the paint around. And that's, I then decided that it is a mountainscape with a river of something below with greenery and flash of color. Yeah. So the next one, yeah. Okay, now this one starts with the initial, um, practice with the light and dark or the ISO level and here we see if we can go through each picture do you think it will be sequential there we see okay that one's really bright light access and it's changed the colors it also does the shadowing that we see and here um, there's a warm accent and another one had a cooler accent. You'll see that on the single page of the, um, in the book that we have. Now, uh, during the time that we were taking the photography course, uh, a lot of plants were coming into bloom. And um, this one didn't get painted yet, <laughs> but I was very intrigued by the blue sky behind and the, the distance, and often when I, paint it's either color the contrast of color that catches my eye or it's the perspective that allows us to look into the distance and see something up close in the foreground and then the light and dark behind and the distance so those often are um, a focus of my paintings here we see another example of high so low so iso um, this is me kayaking i included this because this um, has some other relations to other photographs that i have in my in the book um, i'm often with my digital camera on my cell phone um, sometimes it's tough when i'm kayaking to keep it level <laughs> and not bouncy and moving um, there's a lovely photograph of a turtle on a log um, that's in the picture. This one is an actual painting of a photograph. And the there's, yeah, that's okay. Um, in the book, you'll see the painting, uh, the photograph rather, and then you will see this, um, the painting of that photograph. Uh, here we're seeing me in my kayak catching the light of the stones under the water and the light on the uh, very damaged river uh, embankments that happened in the 2017 and 2019 floods in the Dorval area. This is the infamous McConnell place which has now been turned into Royal K development. And they have definitely, these 
embankments will not be there anymore. So like, um, who was that? That was uh, Mar Marilyn, is that Marilyn? Yeah, uh, talked about how things change because they get destroyed. Jackie. And uh, this is an example of how I'm capturing light and dark and I'm in, intrigued by that in my paintings. Um, here is uh, the first tulips blooming this spring when we were doing photography. And I didn't include that in the actual tulips, but they were what inspired me to paint this very quick painting. Here's my turtle. I love the under the water effect and uh, it really was interesting to include these in these photographs in this uh, book. Um, the one thing I'd like to talk about is why was I intrigued by this study, this research study? And it was really the word age. And I had just, I was about to turn 70. And because we were all um, recruited as 65 plus, I felt that there would be something in this study that would help me see the um, the value of aging. <laughs> and uh, the introduction of the photography class really uh, helped me see that there are many opportunities for us through our eyes to perceive what is ahead of us. And so I think the, um, the opportunity to take this course, the photography course within the study, helped me realize that uh, there's a lot more creating I have to do. And the, um, the joy that it gives me when I can look at something in a photograph because the color caught me or the perspective caught me. And I was hooked into this project because of the concept of aging. But aging now is perceived because we sort of called some of this are, are evolving into becoming, not aging, but becoming. And we're all of us now in our third act. It's the last 30 years of our lives. And what we need to do now is to explore more and not make it the end. OLD is not the end. It's just a beginning. It's a becoming. It's what we strive to do and help others appreciate all the things that we have seen and how we can help support the youth of today in what they're endeavoring to do through technology. And um, this photography class really helped me see that I'm capable. I can continue to create with lots more energy than I thought I had. And so this book has been wonderful to see it all. Is it me who should drop the mic or is it she who should <laughs> drop the mic? <laughs> I don't want to break it. Jacqueline over there said, no, no, don't drop it, don't drop it. No, I'm not going to. Um, well, I'm speechless at the moment, but those who are not, please go ahead and ask questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. Take a lot of photos out in nature, so a lot of natural light. How does the time of day affect your photography skills? Well, um, that those chairs that were in that are in the book, that is something that I did try to experiment with as well, and um, I found that by using the chair, 
to do, you'll see in the book that they're not in the exact same position, and that's because it's a different time of day. And I wanted to create a shadow a little bit more um, by raising or lowering the ISO. So, yeah. You could, uh... um, Jacqueline, yes. one, of, one of the things that you talk about in the, in the book is how you take photos and then you paint them to challenge yourself. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that challenge? Well, that's right. Um, again, going back to color contrasts or perspective. I see that sometimes perspective can get right out of whack. And so it requires a lot of sketching. So first in my little sketchbook, I sketch it and I've taught to focus on the darks and the lights and then what's in the foreground, what's in the background. And, um, and then to to build on that and to actually create an image that looks like the photograph. Um, but as the first one is showing the, the first picture that I think is one of the last in the book, uh, the abstract, that is something I would really like to get a little bit more of. And, and with the different ISOs, there's one that has quite a lot of light and it changed the green of the leaf and so then that leads me to think, okay, well, maybe everything should be much brighter and therefore more abstract. And uh, that helps. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, yes. if there are no more questions, we leave Anything the else? rest of them yeah. for lunch. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody need a coffee, water, juice break? If not, we go to the next presenters. Um, and I think in the book that should be, well, actually, Jack, you are the first, so I'm not sure you just walked in. Are you ready to talk about your work, Jack Zilek, or you want to wait for others? Okay, so we go. You don't have to prepare. You don't have to prepare anything, but but uh, but I think what I what I can um, say is that uh, Jack takes pictures to create things other than pictures, and I think uh, one of the things that has been striking uh, to me is the infinite possibilities that you exercise in your photography. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? And then we are going to have questions for you. Okay. Um, I guess, can you, can you hear? Yeah. Um, I guess I should start by saying, generally speaking, what I try to do is just take images. Uh, um, sorry, do you mind holding it a bit closer to you just so we like can? Like this? Yeah, just better. Yeah. OK. Uh, as I started to say, uh, really, I just take images, um, even step back a bit. Uh, I almost feel a little embarrassed talking about uh, something called photography, because really what I think I do is really just dick around and take pictures with, with my cell phone uh, and then just see what I can come up with. Um, generally speaking, uh, as I mentioned in the book, don't really Start, don't really pay so much attention to the to framing the image. Uh, as we just heard, the attention that you put to uh, the different uh, aspects and control aspects that the camera provides. Um, but really what I do is I just take pictures of things that I see that I think are around, look interesting, uh, and then really after the fact play with the um, the uh, photo editing uh, capabilities that come with the, with the iPhone uh, that I use in any case. Really, I'm driven by color. Uh, and then the other aspect of it would be the idea of somehow creating some kind of a story uh, or uh, a montage of uh, images that uh, in many cases are really the same image just shown from in a different way 
playing around with the color, the light, the exposure, the intensity, uh, all of these things. Um, that was a bit of an exercise that we had in, one, in the course in terms of trying to do something a little different, getting outside your comfort zone. So when, I think in that case, it was including the, uh, the shadow uh, into the, in, in the image. Um, I think that uh, this was also something where normally I'm driven by color here. The idea was just to play around and show the images in black and white. Uh, and what effect it has. Um, I think the, the, this is uh, an image that I really, I really like. Uh, it's really uh, the bottom of um, a bowl, a sculptured bowl. Uh, just turn it upside down, put it on a black um, background, uh, and then took the, the shot. Uh, and then I, there are others, I don't know if we're showing them, but we, show the three colors uh, and the idea there was just the the idea of putting a story together with the three the three planets uh, whatever they are um, and that that's part of that um, but Jack what is this uh, what is this object it's it it's, looks like it's a, a planet ceramic, it's a ceramic bowl oh it's a, I thought it's, it's a, a it's planet. I thought it's a, I thought it's a planet you've discovered yeah yeah, yeah I did <laughs> Anyway, it's a secret, and I don't want to tell anybody. Um, this is just, uh, again, uh, playing around with uh, an image of a sunflower in a, in a vase that had sort of seen better days, was starting to wilt, and really just giving it a different, a different look, a different vibrancy. Um, these are images as obvious. They're just images of... Uh, discarded items, trash on, on sidewalks, on the ground. Uh, and really there, it was taking the images, playing around with the color, and then arranging them in a color sequence where the color kind of flowed, I guess, so it's blue, purpley, over to the oranges with greens in the middle. Uh, so I was doing a lot of that as well. Um, I think that one of the other issues that I'd mentioned in the in in our discussion or in the book was um i guess the whole notion of how and in this case we have the the eggshells my wife was making cookies or something um and just how we're what the impact of the color is on the same image when we look at it and how we react differently viscerally uh and i guess the other question that i come back to is um which one's real? Uh, I see this as green, uh, but is that what it is? Uh, and, and, you know, you can just extend that whole thing and you can go on forever on that, and I really won't do that, but, uh, unless you want me to. But um, that, that's, I think, another aspect of um, what we were, or what I was looking at. Uh, I think uh, also maybe to kind of wind down, um, the issue of the course, I th I'm really not sure. I think I sort of looked at the course as um, I really didn't feel I had a choice. My wife said that I really had to do it. I'm not a joiner. Uh, it's about the last thing I wanted to do, and I thought I'd get through. And you know, when you talk about, uh, at a, I think I'd mentioned the only qualification I had was a 65 plus, and um, I say okay. <laughs> Uh, we'll, tr we'll try it. But I, I, I did find it interesting. I found the discussions very interesting. I think people, uh, you know, as I said, I'm very humbled by the work that people, other people in the groups were, were providing or coming up with. Uh, I really don't f feel I fit in that area at all. Um, but the one thing that sort of came through the course, if it was a question of trying to give some kind of structure or, or framework or some kind of reason to say, why am I doing this? Uh, I guess it, you try and find some sense, and the sense that I was finding was the whole issue of transformation. Uh, and then I guess to make a really simple metaphor, you, you know, taking an image of something, transforming it to a digital file, then playing around with it, so transforming it further, then printing it, and then, uh, in this case, putting it up on the wall, so transforming the space where, where, it's, where it's going. 
Uh, and so I guess um, that's part of what came out of the course, came out of the course for me. And uh, that's about it. Um, thank you. Um, so even if you go back one, I'll just, uh, yeah, this sure. one. Sure. No, the, the one I, I saw one there that wasn't. Uh, this show. one, this yeah. one, yeah. Uh, just to just to finalize, because I've had people comment on that, and really all that is is just some flower petals and some uh, uh, the balance of a flower that uh, I just threw on the floor, took a picture. So you can see the first two are the same image. The other one I think maybe I flipped around, and then just played around with the color to try and you know create coming together. Uh, some kind of an image. I'm not really sure what, but it seems to get a lot of attention. Anyway, that's it. Um, thank you, Jack, and, and thanks for sort of continuing to be part of uh, part of uh, this project. I really appreciate the fact that you have come out after you know short after surgery. That's uh, really heartwarming. Um, anyone has questions? I think you did answer my question. I wanted to ask you about the transformation. Uh, so, so thank you for answering that. But does anyone else have questions for Jack? On that last photo, uh, on, on the last photos that you just showed um, of the flower petals, how did you get the blue and the yellow behind? Um, I didn't learn that in the photography class. <laughs> oh, sure. That's yes, I did. No, no, I didn't. we didn't really didn't really go into it. It just had to do. It's just an aspect of the editing, playing around with the intensities and then the the brightness. And uh, when you do that, and I guess you, I think people who I've worked with developing and that's I'm much more familiar with this than I am. But uh, it really picks up any bit of any of those colors and you can sort of intensify those and reduce the others and warmness and tint and all of those things and it's really just it's really in some ways distorting it but uh it's also just another view thank you thank you jack uh much appreciated next jack uh titsworth <laughs> You should have done all the Jacks and uh, Jackies uh, first, but. <laughs> so if you please go there because they want you to be under the spotlight and. Uh... We're just missing a Jill. <laughs> so, so what I can say is that um, when Jack and uh, Denise joined the, joined the study and started sharing their photos, um, I think um, a lot of people who actually are not here, they were intimidated by their photographic, not only abilities, but also the, the scope of the subject matters that they've had the, the opportunity to cover. And I think uh, I'm not the right person to talk about all of those stories, so I just let Jack go through everything as much as he wants. And I'm going to sort of go through the photos if you like to talk about them one by one, or if you want to give an introduction, what works best for you. Let me give a little introduction. Um, I've never been able to draw a picture or paint a picture. Um, I have no artistic abilities whatsoever when it comes to doing something with my hand, as my wife can attest. Um, I, I'm not too bad at music. I recently won a composition competition for the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I, I, a tune that I composed will, will be the tune that all of the police in Canada will start playing to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the RCMP. So uh, th that's an area where I, I have some ability. <laughs> Um, I can't draw, but early on, my father was a pretty good photographer, and he tried to explain to me. And then I went to university, and I had, I had two good colleagues who became really good photographers, and they began showing me how the camera worked and whatnot, and so on. And then I studied forestry and specialized in macroecology. And when you're an ecologist, a macroecologist, you look and you see how all of the world is integrated. 
And you see in that picture, for example, one animal called a human being, and then you see a bunch of plants, but there are thousands of life forms there that you can't see. And I'm always aware of those. Anyway, my career took me traveling, working in international development, and I had this macro view of things. Um, up here, oh, we just missed the pre previous photo, shows trees with a whole with hundreds of bats suspended from it. Uh, and here is just um, a, a beautiful flower. So I learned to photograph. Th these birds are called secretary birds, and that's in Uganda, in East Africa. Oh, Denise is correcting me. Crested crane, sorry. Yes. And here we're in an old market in New Delhi, where I used to shop when I lived in India. And this photo was taken from about 25 meters away with a um, photographic lens. And this cute little old lady is smoking. And I tried to catch her with the smoke coming out, and I just missed it. There she's staring at me, and I photographed her, but I didn't catch the smoke. Is this a digital photograph, or this is the pre-digital photography that you did? Pardon me? Is this, is this taken with a digital camera, or? Oh, with a big camera, yes. Digital. Digital, yes. And here, th this is, um, as you can see, wallowing on the sea. <laughs> and uh, we just took all kinds of pictures of these animals. And I lived in East Africa for a total of, I think, 12 years and went out to the game parks, game parks, to the animal parks. And this is a combination of uh, zebras and, and wildebeest, which is very common in East Africa. And this is walking through <laughs> a market in Kampala, Uganda. And this girl is getting her toenails done by, by that man. And, and, and this is just showing how plants can, for some reason or other, get all twisted. That, that's, that's here in, in Montreal. This is a boy called Alan, <coughs> whose mother was our son's nanny for 12 years. And uh, we first met her in Kenya. And after um, Kenya, we moved to Washington, and she came with us. So she was, our, as I say, our son's nanny for several years in Kenya and the US. She got married to a fellow Kenyan in Washington and had um, Alan as a, as a baby. And uh, we were always invited to his birthday parties. And so at one occasion when he saw a present, he went, wow. And I just happened to catch him. And there, we're in um, Tanzania, out in a park, and this is a, a Maasai lady, all beautifully dressed. This is a very common mode of dress for them. And she's carrying a traditional kind of club, which people use to defend themselves or to attack, whichever. There we're in a, in a balloon, and as we went over the water, I was able to catch the reflection down below. Oh, this is a lady in Rajasthan in India who wasn't completely pleased with my having taken her picture. But that's a typical kitchen, if you will, in, in many parts of India. So um, I forget what time of day it was. She's either preparing something for, for lunch or for dinner. And uh, this is another person I tried to catch smoking. We were coming in from a, a, a tour on, on, um, on a lake, and uh, he was sitting near the dock. And so I, again with a telephoto, snapped a few pictures, but I missed the smoke. There, this is a, I forget your name, is that an alligator or a crocodile? Crocodile. Yes, that's in um, East Africa, 
and I just caught him again with the telephoto, and he's obviously got his eye on something. I, I forget what. There we are. Um, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, I hope I didn't went through your photos too quickly, but if I did, uh, now you have uh, time to, to, to talk about them. Does anyone have questions for, for Jack? I'm sorry, Jack, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, you, you mentioned the issue in one or two, and especially this one, or you have a couple of others where you're taking images of people, and in this case, you, you mentioned that this person was not too uh, pleased with the fact that uh, you were doing that. How do you deal with that? You're right, I was sort of naughty. I was <laughs> at a distance from her, <laughs> so I just did it. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't have. It wasn't very good manners, but... I did it. It was she was so fascinating. So so that because because a lot of these um, photos you've taken with a telelens and the telelens allows you to be invisible to the people or things that you're photographing. Um, I, I completely understand because I have done it so. Uh, you see a beautiful scene and you just can't resist it and the privacy of being whatever a thousand meters away from them <laughs> is uh, is making you to be naughty and then sort of uh, subjectify uh, the, the subjects of your of, of your photograph but that is not something that you can do with cell phones so how do you you know where do cell phones come in for you now as a tool for photography are they any useful to you and your model well the telephone is certainly my instrument for day-to-day -day photography and i have a little camera that i can carry on my belt if i'm going to be more serious and then i have my nikon with the various lenses if we're going out to do a specific photographic tour then then you take the big cameras mm -hmm. I was just wondering, Jack, uh, if you ever got anybody who was actually smoking, did you get the smoke? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, the cameras need to be trained better to sort of zoom on, on the smoke. Nowadays, they're doing a lot of things for us. Merle. Um, speaking of telephoto lenses and sneaking pictures and smoking, I have a story to tell. I was in Thailand, I think, at a temple, a Buddhist temple, and I was fascinated. No, it was India. Well, anyway, I was traveling and at a temple, and I saw a monk in saffron robes with a bunch of exotic orchids that he was putting into vases presumably to later install in the temple and i he was crouched down he was squatting actually so his face and the flowers were in the same plane i thought it was a quite successful picture uh, back in the days of film so you can't exactly check it wasn't until i printed it in a cibachrome format that I discovered he was actually hiding a cigarette amongst the orchids between his and in the palm of his hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, I think we should uh, naturally follow Jack with uh, his partner of uh, many decades, uh, Denise. <laughs> Thank you. Do I need to sit? Yes, well, if you're more comfortable. To, I think they want us to sit so we are not moving in and out of the, 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 the frame. Also to be comfortable. I know I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm teasing everyone here. Um, 
So, so well, I mean, I think, yes, um, Jack just told us maybe two lines of his um, fascinating travels around the world, but on uh, quite a bit of them, you have been his companion, so why don't you tell us? And unlike he who said he couldn't paint when he was young, you have always had an interest in art, so maybe yes. you can tell us about where the photogra photography comes in. And uh, uh, I think l later, actually, I, I used the camera when I was younger, but uh, not seriously, more just snapping what I saw. And uh, but I, I've always been a visual person. I wanted to study in arts, but at the time, uh, my father convinced me that maybe I should earn a living somewhat, some other ways. So I went into uh, political science and it took me uh, into international development. And basically uh, there, there were so many opportunities, you know, so much beauty to see around and uh, that I became very interested in photography, especially as our son was uh, keen on photography. And as I said in the book, I think it's there. We, we just waited for him to take his photos and sat around. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should start doing the same thing. And or I would tell him, oh, Raphael, here's a shot to take. And he said, mommy, why don't you buy your own camera and take your own photos? Then you'll have some satisfaction. So that's how it started. Uh, and I, as I grew older, I just thought, no, I need to keep busy after retirement. What am I going to do? I didn't want to work. I wanted to get back to some form of art. So I took uh, uh, watercolor, classes, uh, other, uh, painting with the iPad. And finally, I settled on photography and started taking classes. But, I, but I'm not a serious photographer. I just like taking photos. So uh, this first one that's there actually is taken in the Eastern Township. Um, Again, our son sort of woke us up five in the morning. We have to get there before, you know, for the golden hour of the morning. So we were walking with him along uh, uh, Cherry River in in the marshes, and that's one of the photos that I that I took as uh, we walked around. And well, that's similar to Jack. This one was in uh, in Tanzania, where we often went. You know, we took advantage of the fact that we lived in Kenya and Tanzania to see probably the best game reserves on this planet. So uh, this one was taken in a caldera, basically a collapsed crater, the Ngorongoro crater, where uh, there were lots of uh, lots of zebras, wildebeest. It was probably at the time of the migration too. Ah. This one, <laughs> yes, we were uh, we we took a road trip that took us from Montreal to Vancouver and then down through the U.S. And we were in Wyoming somewhere on a Sunday afternoon, looking for a place to eat, and we saw this little diner, and we were kind of reluctant to go in, but as we did, it it, it just came fascinated by everything that was there. It was a collection of uh, bottles and uh, and everything else, but I just liked the uh, the impression. Acted automatically. <laughs> no problem. Uh, this is uh, this is more recent. Actually, it was one of the photos that I took right after we had the last Zoom session together in Kelowna. Uh, British Columbia, we were, um, we were in Vernon and I just, I was still inspired by, by what I'd learned from the, uh, the others in the group, you know, how you can use photos to paint and so on. So I just saw that this one, the colors were, were just, just great and I took it. 
Ah, well, I guess this one is obvious. It's in Montreal, but I'm also fascinated by architectures and the lines and the juxtaposition of the old and new all at once. And that I took with my uh, little Lumix camera, which has a 300 zoom lens. So uh, um, it works It works well, and it's portable, so I can use it uh, more you, easily. You didn't find any people sitting somewhere sunbathing um, for you to take naughty photos of? <laughs> Actually, I didn't focus on them. <laughs> Jack would have. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, this is the, the I, I think it's the same lady that Jack took. But uh, we were in uh, in Kenya, not in Tanzania, as you said. <laughs> we were in Amboseli National Park, and this lady wanted to sell us all kinds of, uh, you know, jewelry, like she's wearing all of these things. There were actually quite a few of them around, uh, so we asked permission to take uh, to take photos in exchange for buying something. Can I take a photo? And uh, she said yes. And just beside her, there was a younger lady, which I also took. But somehow, uh, you know, just all the uh, the lines on her face uh, which were just, and, and her smile. I just thought, you know, here is a, a nomad who sort of walks around, probably gets, gets told by people, no, I don't want to buy your things, but she's still there smiling. And um, I, she just looked kind to me. So I like the kindness in her face. That's another one in the, in the Ngorongoro crater, those uh, wildebeest that are, were walking along. And I just like the lines that it did, the, very, the various colors and, uh, and just the fact that everything was sort of horizontal in a way. Oh, my friend. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of elephants, so I couldn't, uh, couldn't resist. And actually, didn't even need a, photo, uh, a telephoto lens for that one. They, can, they come quite close to you. And we've learned from, uh, from the drivers, the, the guys' drivers, that you can get close as long as you don't move and you don't startle them. So that was one of those photos. And again, this one was uh, part of our uh, course assignment. assignment that we had to, uh, to do. Uh, and this one was in that, that same uh, marshes where we were before. And the light was so incredible. And I thought, oh, if I can manage to catch that uh, web, it would be great. So I was kind of happy that it happened. Uh, there was in a market in Peru, and I just just loved all the colors and everything that was there together. I'm not sure I would attempt a painting of that, but uh, maybe an abstract for Jacqueline. <laughs> yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Uh, just want to say that uh, as uh, Jacqueline was talking about, uh, we need to keep going. We still have there are still things to learn, and that's what that's basically what I enjoy. But it made me think is that we still need to click, <laughs> not just with the camera, but us need to click, keep clicking. So yeah, well, thank you. Um, does anybody have questions for Denise? So how often do you take your big camera equipment around to take photos nowadays? Are the cell phones doing it for you entirely? Uh, on the day-to-day -day basis, the cell phone does it. The, um, uh, sometimes I take my little Lumix if I, if I feel that I really want to look for something special. Otherwise, we just walk around with, uh, with the, the cell phone. And I take the big camera if we go on a trip where I can, you know, have ways to uh, cart it around. But um, one thing I wanted to say is that during the pandemic, uh, that that's the one one thing that happened during the pandemic is that we we really, as we were confined to our surroundings, 
we really started walking around our neighborhoods and, and, and looking at things like Peter was saying, just looking at ordinary things and seeing the beauty and what was around us. So I, I made a point of taking at least one photo a day that I wanted to look at after and started to see if I could uh, do like uh, Jack is doing, so play with the adjustments and, uh, and make it a painting, make it a black and white or an abstract. So I don't share those, but I have them. <laughs> And, and you also mentioned that during the pandemic, you sort of started taking more of these online uh, classes. And as you said, uh, creating these clicking communities with whom uh, you were learning things such as yeah. baking bread. Actually, yes. And, uh, and actually, uh, a lot of uh, research related to the Perform Center, because I thought one thing that we should contribute to is as you're looking for older adults, uh, that we should contribute uh, to to the research of what uh, what can be learned from us, and through this one, of course, the attraction was both the age group, but the photography angle. In the end, I think the photography became secondary to the sharing with the people and realizing that uh, photo, you know, photography can be a lot more than photography if you look at it through uh, paint, you know, to a painter's eyes or to any other ways. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um... And uh, last but not least, uh, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon, you're also closing. Uh, well, uh, Sheila is missing in action. So yes, you're, you have the last chapter. Your chapter is called Searching. Uh, you are also, like many other, a, um, a painting artist. Um, so I think I should, I should let you talk about how you take photos and you take imperfect, create imperfect art from per perfect nature. Well, yeah, <laughs> basically, I figure there's some uh, some pictures that they're just they're parts of nature. I can't duplicate the creator, so I'll just, you know, take take the picture and maybe I'll paint something about it or how I feel about it. And this is Froggy and he's pretty well my favorite guy. And I took him for many reasons. I, I'm very strong on um saving our waterways and our nature and mostly all my pictures are about nature and they're probably things that people might not have noticed like i like frogs and mushrooms and and i like things that are micro microscopic and i like things at different angles but this guy was very exciting for me when i found him because our lake used to have lots and lots of frogs and this is one of the few frogs that we had in our lake and this was up in the Laurentians and so just to have a picture of him it was a way I think for me to say hey world frogs they tell us a lot about our water you know let's keep an eye on these frogs so that's one of the things from that was one of my favorite pictures anyway but for me nature is is about woods and snow and trees. I love trees. And so I paint trees and I take pictures of trees and people go, what are you doing? Well, I like texture. So I'm doing tree bark and angles of tree bark, and that kind of thing. So a lot of times I'll take a picture and then I will use that picture as inspiration for a painting. But there's other paintings like uh, this picture took four years because to get all the guys doing that at the same time is a lot of work. <laughs> and we would see duck families come along and, and uh, I just thought that was amazing. Someone asked about how long it took to do a painting. Well, painting is variable, but a picture can take four years. <laughs> um, this is a, a painting of mine. Uh, it's a watercolor painting of caves in Nerja, Spain. I went with a group of a traveling group of artists and I 
I get extremely excited when about caves and um, uh, the structures of of mountains and and the structure of objects. And this is one that I had done actually in the cave, unbeknownst to the authorities, because <laughs> you're not supposed to stop there. Um, I'm very uh, drawn to water, and uh, this is my mystic kayaker, I call it. And the kayak and water and solitude and quiet is important to me. And this was a fellow that was actually an artist, we found out later, uh, who lived across the lake from us. But we do a lot, and a lot of my photographs and paints are from my kayak. Um, as such, uh, it's a little bit tricky to carry a camera and a kayak because kayaks do overturn. Not often, but they still do overturn, and you can ruin. I have ruined a camera or two that way. <laughs> We had a, an, uh, an underwater camera when we were in Hawaii, and we took fantastic pictures um, in the water. That was so fun. Um, so I had that for several years. Uh, but I like my Nikon. I think this is a Nikon picture. But I also use my cell phone. And I'm using my cell phone more and more just because especially during the pandemic, I don't really want to carry a lot of stuff around. I, I basically have stuff in my pockets, what, but to carry my Nikon, I, I'm not always that happy with. I love mushrooms. I love the, the fact that they're so transitory. They're there one day and they're not the next. So if you're going to take a picture, you got to do it then. And that's one of the things I find with the cell phone is I take pictures on the move. Uh, any of the pictures I have and people who traveled with me go, oh God, she's taking another picture. And I've taken a lot of pictures. I don't have time to, to spend, most times, to spend five minutes setting up, getting the lighting, getting the angle. So as a result of that, I've taken my 10,000 pictures and many of them are, you know, but I've learned now what not to do. And so that's helped me to be able to take a picture or two or change where I'm standing um, maybe perhaps look at the time of day, because that's important, and um, take the best picture I can. I don't alter my pictures much. I try and uh, frame them when I take them, so I'll, I'll do some basic um, enhancements, but I, I don't use Photoshop or other, it's, I just, um, I feel if I didn't get a good picture, I just didn't get a good picture. I don't want to fool around with that. I'm not a gimmick person or, um, somebody who likes to fool around with stuff. And that's about it. <laughs> Mushrooms are your favorite, uh, I think, um, ephemeral uh, objects, subjects. Well, Do one of the things I've found too is that trees and mushrooms, my background is, uh, I used to teach nursing uh, for several years and what I found is um, mushrooms is, are becoming so important in the research for a lot of different diseases. So that makes it even more interesting for me. <laughs> um, but I do like mushrooms, just like you. <laughs> so, um, let, let me ask another question. You and Marilyn, uh, you were not in a group. You were doing this um, exercise. Uh, solo and yet uh, you have sort of joined the rest of us in doing this group work so how was your experience with this study not being uh, you know not having the fun of weekly meetings with the with the rest of the team what well, was interesting about the digital yeah. photography course if anything well the course the course was interesting because um i'm not much of a gadget person and i still need to learn more about using my nikon better but like I've done a lot of the automatic set of settings for my cameras and, um, but I've also carried my Nikon down to Vietnam with a soldier, you know, with a, a, one of those straps around it. I don't think I'll do that again. <laughs> it's just too hard to, you know, I, I needed a smaller camera when I went to Vietnam. But uh, I guess I found it was, 
it wasn't a great time for me during the course because I was in the middle of uh, arranging a show and I didn't have the time. I was a bit jealous when I heard from Jackie that she was in this group and they were, you were having such fun. But since then, with the Zooms, uh, I've had a chance to uh, get to know some people and certainly appreciated the input of so many people. Like I've been really fooling around a lot more with uh, whatever pictures I'm doing um based on how people have adjusted and that and that's that's been very helpful for me um i'll ask one question and then i'll uh, let you ask because i'm going to forget my questions uh, so when we were organizing this you were busy with organizing an actual physical material painting uh, vernissage um, so how do you compare the experience of the digital vernissage to an actual traditional one uh, one of the things that we thought oh, we would experiment with and we would talk about is, uh, you know, how is this presentation uh, different? Do you, would you like to sort of comment on it as somebody who organizes such, such events? Oh, this is, this is a lot of fun. A lot more fun than I had organizing the, because <laughs> I was organizing during the pandemic when nothing was open. <laughs> and what was open was extremely expensive and it was beyond our budget. So, um, usually in, in a vernissage, uh, traditional vernissage, as you know, you, you are, uh, find a place and then from there you uh, look at the size that you want for your paintings and then from there you have your artists that are coming. In the, this is in a group uh, vernissage. And then people come and bring their, their paintings and hang, we hang them. And then you have your actual night where you have them. And even this year was unusual. I mean, we we didn't serve wine and cheese because it's not really a great thing to do with this during the COVID time. So it's it's not as uh, vibrant as this is. And I find this kind of fun just to to know a little bit about each of the artists and why they took. Like you can do that in a vernissage, but. To go to each artist who's giving you a visual art and talk to them about it, it takes a long time. This way, you get a chance to get everybody's uh, point of view and why they did it and how they did it and how it affected them. So I think it's a lot of fun. I wasn't quite sure how today was going to come. And I figured, well, I didn't have to organize it. That's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how it's going to come. I think it just, like the rest of this study, it defined uh, itself. Does anybody have questions for uh, Sharon? No. Well, then I should not stand between you and the uh, little tiny lunch that we have had uh, Petit Mans prepare for us. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you.